Okay. All right. Um, ERAS, why bother? And I hope we can answer that question today. Um, ERAS means enhanced recovery after surgery. Um, and I just want to say a few remarks. What is it? Research-based way of managing pre-, intra-, and post-operative interventions in concert to optimize outcomes in the patient experience. Um, ERAS programs have been a standard practice in Europe for many years and consist of up to 21 different components. These enhanced recovery programs have demonstrated significant reductions in length of stay, blood loss, time to ambulation, and complications, and increased patient satisfaction around pain. And they're being used in 95% of surgery patients in the United Kingdom. Uh, when I went to the uh, AATS last year, a gentleman in the top right-hand corner is Dan Engelman. He's the driver of ERAS in the United States. Um, and they uh, introduced their ERAS only in 2019. Um, and there was a bit of resistance to introducing into cardiac surgery because they said, well, it was too complex. You know, cardiac surgeons um, were, re were resistant to having recipes because, you know, we kind of thought we knew everything. And you had this heart-lung machine with all its complexity and thought there's no ways we can actually standardize this. Um, and in fact, it's essential to standardize it. And if you look at where do the mortalities occur, preventable mortalities, we're not talking about morbidity, we're talking about mortalities. And we can see it starts before surgery, 35% before surgery, 25% in the ICU, 11% on the floor, and 10% at discharge, and only 19% intraoperatively. So I think the surgeons do their job, their technical part well, but it's everything else that makes the difference. And unfortunately, we've kind of got multiple recipes with multiple people with multiple ideas, a lot of which is absolutely no evidence base, and it does affect outcomes. So this was the guidelines that, that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2019, and that's available for everybody. I think we, we just mentioned it last year. And the idea is to use a class of recommendation and levels of evidence. And the class of recommendation goes from one to three, where it's strong, where the benefit is great, moderate, where the benefit is greater than the risk, um, weak, where the benefit is still greater than the risk, and three, where there is no benefit, uh, benefit equal to risk, or there can be harm. So that's the guidelines we need to follow. And then we look at levels, um, levels of evidence. The ultimate level of evidence is the randomized controlled trial, um, and it's lacking in a lot of cardiac surgical um, literature. Um, but there is a lot of evidence out there now, and it's coming fast. Um, a meta-analysis of high-quality randomized trials um, and one or more randomized trials corroborated by registry studies. And then BR is moderate quality evidence from one or more randomized clinical trial. A meta-analysis of moderate quality trials. And then BNR, moderate quality evidence from one or more well-designed, well-executed, non-randomized studies or observational studies. CLD is randomized or non-randomized observational studies with limitations of design. And CEO is the consensus of expert opinion, which is the worst level of evidence. Um, we talk about ECMO. Most of the evidence in ECMO at the moment is expert opinion. Um, and in cardiac surgery, certainly, it was expert opinion. And the idea is to get people out of their comfort zone. We, what tends to happen is that we start doing something, and we don't look at what we do, and we think it's OK. So we kind of feel safe and in control, and let's not change anything, because it seems to be OK. Um, but what you actually have to do is get out of that zone and into the fear zone and start looking at what you're doing. Uh, and you tend to find excuses and you're affected by what other people say. To get into the learning zone, which deals with the challenges and the problems, you acquire new skills and you extend your comfort zone and you do better. And finally, into the growth zone, um, which you know, where you, you find more purpose in what you do 
you can set new goals and conquer objectives, which is to do better. Uh, we all know about the Dunning-Kruger effect, and this is unskilled and unaware of it. And I think this is one of the problems, is that, um, you know, how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence leads to an inflated self-awareness. And I think cardiac surgeons were often guilty of that. You had the dogmatic uh, way we were all trained. And as Bill Murray says, it's hard to win an argument with a smart person, but it's damn near impossible to win an argument with a stupid person. Surgeons sometimes are a bit stupid. Um, and the, it's what they call the illusory superiority. I really like this slide. Um, because if you look at that blue graph, where right at the beginning where you know nothing, um, you're at the peak of Mount Stupid. You know everything. You've got all the answers, and no one's going to tell you how to do it. And then you reach the valley of despair when you discover that actually you do know nothing, and that's really important. And then we can improve by going up the slope of enlightenment and then eventually we reach the, reach the plateau of sustainability that everybody talks about today. And hopefully through this program we can do that. And you're probably all familiar with Daniel Kahneman who talks about thinking fast and slow. <clears throat> We've got Homer Simpson on the one side. And, and that's kind of we just know, you know, we just know. But there's no evidence for what we know. Um, as opposed to uh, Dr. Spock on the other side. Slow, effortful, and logical. Um, and through this process, let's make our patient care better. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Fran Stiert. And thank you so much for being here this morning. Very excited to be part of the JJ and J Cardiac ERAS team. Um, the topic that I've been given for this morning, as mentioned, is preoperatively looking at A1C and correction of nutritional deficiency. Again, it's so exciting to be placing um, a value on optimizing our patient care, their journey, and their recovery as a multidisciplinary team and being part of that. The first bullet or point under this expert recommendation is preoperative measurement of HbA1c is recommended to assist with risk stratification. So just looking at a little bit of the terminology in this sentence, HbA1c, just a reminder for us, it's looking at a patient's uh, blood test, looking at the average sugars over the last two to three months. Risk stratification is a technique for systematically categorizing patients based on their health status and other factors. So the main point here is that if we are able to assess prior to surgery, the aim would be to have an HbA1c of less than 6.5%. This has been shown to decrease complications post-surgery, including sternal wound infection and myocardial ischemia. The practical implementation of this is obviously having enough time prior to surgery to assess what their level is. Um, it basically equates, a 6.5% HbA1c equates to sugars of less than 7 or 8. And again, as we know, a lot of our cardiac patients that we are seeing have been uncontrolled poor diabetics. And so I think where a lot of research is still needed is if they are electively admitted to the program, is whether as a team we decide to um, delay the surgical procedure until such time as we have improved glycemic control. At this point as well, is if we do know if their HbA1c is high or their sugars are high, to please refer to a dietitian so that we can in get involved in terms of dietary changes, lowering carbohydrates, etc. The next point here is preoperative correction of nutritional deficiency is recommended where feasible. I think again looking at feasibility of are they an emergent patient where we maybe meet them only post-surgery or are they an elective surgery patient that is admitted at an earlier stage um, which gives us a very different picture. 
the main point under here is that if the albumin levels are less than 30, and again, the optimal range being 35 and above, so already we are on the back foot, um, if it is less than 30, it's trying to do five to seven days of intensive supplementation and nutrition therapy prior to surgery. Now, again, I think this is something we're trying to work on, that if they are admitted as soon as admission is done, is that we as a dietetic team uh, get involved in helping the patients to be supplemented. So in terms of practical implementation, we are looking, of course, at a person's um, sources of protein intake. In hospital, we would put them onto a high protein diet. Um, if they are elective and they are at home, in the patient diary, which Renee will be going through later, we have given some very general recommendations about what lean um, protein sources are, if they are vegetarian, what other sources of protein they can receive. Also, there are nice supplements we can use, which are available in store. They do not have to be prescribed if they are at home. If they are in hospital, we obviously have access to really amazing supplements, which are high protein, they are small volumes, and we can prescribe them in hospital. So we try to do this prior to surgery. And again, what Renee will be going through is um, the patient diary. We already, ideally, from day one post-surgery, they are starting to eat and drink, and there is supplementations that they would need to take. These supplements, again, are not uh, sorry, specified in the patient diary. We leave it up to the dietetic team involved to be prescriptive and make it very specific to the patient care and their outcome. And there ends my talk. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm not going to show all that much differently to uh, <laughs> um, it, uh, I think what I'm going to say is nothing new. Everybody here already knows uh, about uh, the, the pre-op uh, starvation period. Um, I think, firstly, we, we're talking about ERAS here, which is enhanced recovery of, of, uh, uh, of patients after surgery. But it's important for us not to, get, to lose sight of the basics, and I think that's really where we should start. And that translates for me directly to the fact that over the years, all of our disasters, or many of our disasters in, in, in these kind of things, are because we've had somebody new looking after one of our patients. And I, before I even start, I'd like to make a plea. If you are the shift leader in ICU, or if you're the, uh, the sister on the floor in the ward, and you know that there's someone new looking after our cardiac patients. It's important that you check up. It's, it's important that you make sure that they know what they're doing. And I'll get back to that when we talk about insulin management later. But, um, you know, it's very important that someone who's leading up to, to cardiac surgery actually knows what they're supposed to be doing with the patient. Dr. Fulton and Dr. Chen have got um, pre-op protocols that uh, are supposed to be adhered to whenever a patient comes to theatre. And quite often, we'll come and see a patient in the ward, and the nurse looking after the patient actually doesn't have a protocol that she's supposed to go through. And, you know, the, and that, obviously, is because the senior in the, war, in, in the ward is not checking up on her. That's the, the first thing I wanted to say. Um, the second thing is that the, the, the science of having an empty stomach before coming into surgery hasn't changed. Um, if you come into theater with food in your stomach and you get put to sleep, you can have a disaster. Now, that doesn't... Uh, some people are much worse about that than others. If you've had a, um, a Nissen fund application, you tend to be have uh, food sticking in your stomach, and that means that you're at higher risk of, uh, of regurgitating in theater. In cardiac surgery, we don't do fast inductions. We do very slow, careful inductions. And again, that means we don't get rapid control of the airway. And if the patient has got food in his stomach, then he's likely to throw up and breathe it in, and then you've got a major problem. Um, 
much more likely are people, uh, uh, for example, children, their mothers like to come and feed them a whole bottle of milk just before they come to theatre because the poor kid is crying because he's starved. So the, we know that the, the recommendations have not changed uh, over the years. You may not have solid food in your stomach for six hours before you come to theatre. Preferably eight if you have any kind of issue that makes your uh, gastric emptying slower. If you do less than that, then you have a big problem. Um, but that doesn't mean that you now are going to be lying there for 12 hours or more while the system kicks in and comes right and makes sure that you, uh, you know, just because uh, we don't want you to vomit in theatre doesn't mean that you're going to, to die of starvation before you come. So it, it's a system problem that we need to fix and not, um, you, you know, we, we're not trying to torture patients. We need to make sure that patients come to theatre when they're booked and not, if, if we're going to, to postpone a patient for surgery, then we need to think about are we going to give them something to eat or drink before and not just leave them lying in the ward. Um, starvation makes very little difference to the blood volume. Um, so it doesn't make patients unstable in theatre. Um, the blood volume is maintained by drawing fluid out of the interstitial uh, uh, interstitium. And so your patients are going to be stable, but it's a very unpleasant experience for all of them to be starved for longer than necessary. Um, what is new is that they've now discovered that to feed the gut lining is very good for all sorts of things. And the, the gut itself is no longer seen as just a, um, a, a, a tube that the food passes through. Okay? You need to feed the gut lining to manage the health of the entire system. And the way to do that is to give it some glucose just before you go to theater. Um, when we first started doing this, we didn't know whether it was important to have only carbohydrates in the drink, but it's been shown now that you can put protein in it as long as it's a clear fluid. So now we give all of our patients, including diabetics, and in fact even more important than diabetics, a carbohydrate drink two hours before they come to theatre, and we find that that makes it better for them post-op, and it's easier to treat their diabetes post-op as well. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure. Hi, guys. So we operate on patients, do open heart surgery, and we all know what we're doing. We've done it many times. But this is how the patient feels when we come in. Um, they're scared. I mean, imagine you in a strange place with strange people and somebody tells you they want to come cut your chest open and uh, fiddle with your heart. And it's a complete stranger. It's a complete stranger. It's not your best friend. It's not your mate from school. It's not the pastor or the mulana or anyone you trust. And what happens is they usually spin out of control. And the way I like to explain, to explain it to patients is, if you walk out this door, all of us, if any of you walk out this door and you go there and there's a big, suddenly a guy goes ah, and jumps out, you're going to get a hell of a fright, right? But say you walk out the door and somebody tells you, listen, when you walk out, out of the corner of your eye, you're going to see a guy. He's got a red jacket. And as you get closer to him, he's going to stand up. And when he stands up, no, he's going to jump and scream. If you know that before you leave the room, you're going to sort of maybe get a small fright, OK? But you're going to deal with it much better, all right? And I think a lot of the times the mistake is we sort of implementing this clinical outcomes excellence thing. But it's the patient journey that's really important, and they buy in. And it's part of a team, right? We're all part of a team. And it's like playing soccer. You can't have one oak on the field who doesn't know where the ball is. But he is running around. He's going to become a liability. 
Now, we all know where the ball is, and the patient needs to know where the ball is, because the patient is part of the team. And importantly, the patient's family or support system is also part of the team. So I often draw this little thing for, for the patient to, to sort of map out the journey. And we formalizing this now. You know, this is sort of the thing. So when a patient gets diagnosed, often in cath lab, you know, they, they hear the cardiologist going, oh, help. And he's like, lying there like, what the heck is going on now? And then the cardiologist kind of tells him, listen, you know what, I can't put a stent in or whatever, uh, but don't worry, you're going to have surgery, you'll be fine. And then buggers off. Now the oak is, this is quality of life, and this is time. So I'm not saying cardiologists do it badly or don't do it badly. It's just for the patient, it's relatively unexpected. So quality of life at that point is terrible, right? Now, remember the aim of all of this is not to cut and sew and stitch and ICU and fight. And the aim of everything is the same. We all want the same thing. We want the patient's quality of life, step one, to reach this point, which is the optimal quality of life for their age, their physiology, etc. So that's, 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 all our, that's our combined aim. That's just step one. Step two is, you've got to maintain it. You know, that lifestyle modification, all of that kind of stuff. So there's no point getting someone there and then they fade off after a few years and die because of our lack of, of input. So in order to get there, we've got to have an operation. And before that, there's a pre-op phase. And after the up, there's a lot of ups and downs. And that's the guys outside that are going, ah, ah, ah. But if the patient understands every single up and down, they actually go through it easier. If we understand every single up and down. Oh, hell, time's up. Uh, all right. So we discharge the patient here. And you see, the quality of life at discharge is, is, is fine, but that happens at home. So they need to know what happens at home as well. So patient information technology, JJ and J is bringing the delivery of this information to the patient differently. And we're integrating an app, all right, that's going to be available for the, everybody who's involved in the ERAS, ERAS pathway. Rene will tell us about the patient diary. But all that information is going to be digitized, and it's going to be on the patient's phone. It's going to be on our phones, and we're all going to have access to it. So let me stop there before James. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. <laughs> right, there you go. Cool. Thank you so much. OK, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kamir. This is Abigail. For those of you guys who don't know us, we work for Jitesh. And we have the privilege of presenting cardiac prehab, which is an important part of the uh, EROS topic. Okay, so cardiac prehab, just to be punchy and direct, it's quite a dense topic, but we're going to be as brief as possible, is a proactive approach to EROS rather than a reactive approach would be your cardiac rehab. Um, we are focusing on the elective patients in this case, as opposed to your emergency case, where you have more time with the patient before the surgery. So cardiac prehab looks more at um, reducing post-operative mortality, mobility, PPCs, and length of stay in hospital, and as a result, less costs. Cardiac prehab is, um, is a lot of evidence emerging that we can do more pre-operative exercise safely, and early referral is important in this case. Typically, your cardiac prehab program looks at four weeks pre-operatively. Um, we design a home exercise program that the patient will do daily and two supervised sessions a week. It is very important that they do IMT, so that's inspiratory muscle training twice a week, um, set on a set prescription. The program looks at three main domains, and that's your respiratory, your physical, and your education components. We thought we'd include this little visual that's actually uh, more post-operative, but it also links in with your pre-operative, and it covers a lot of domains which have been spoken about already. 
So to start off with, we do an initial assessment, which is very important to establish a baseline subjectively and objectively. Subjectively, we look at quality of life, so your EQ5D5L as well as your hospital anxiety and depression. Then overall, we look at exercise tolerance, which is highly important, general body strength uh, assessed with your peripheral, your hydraulic dynamometers, hand grip strength, and your MIP. So that's your maximal inspiratory pressure. In terms of the respiratory component of a cardiac prehab uh, program, we do a lot of breathing pattern retraining. If you think in terms of post-operative, we have a lot of dysfunctional breathing patterns, phrenic nerve um, uh, paralysis, as well as diaphragm dysfunction, deep breathing exercises. Then we have a lot of chesty patients uh, post-operatively. So your airway clearance techniques pre-operatively would be highly valuable. In terms of lung expansion and diaphragm retraining, IPPB, so your positive pressure breathing would be highly valuable, and then your manual techniques. So for the physical component, our exercise intensity will be prescribed based on the initial fitness assessment and the first six-minute walk test. The predicted target heart rate will be 60 to 75% of the max heart rate, which is the same as of a moderate intensity on the BOG scale. Um, so it will be part of three components, a warm-up, the main physical component, and a cool-down. The main physical component is basically made up of some cardiovascular exercises, light resistance training, and will focus on specific um, activities of daily living that the patients struggle with. Okay, and then for our education component, we'll be speaking about generally what the patient can expect post-surgery, basically the setup, them being in an ICU. Um, we'll speak about the post-rehabilitation, how they'll be mobilizing and on which days they'll be mobilizing, just so that they reduce the stress and the anxiety of the patient so that they're more aware of what um, to expect. Um, then we'll touch on the precautions of cardiac surgery. So we'll teach them about log rolling, so bed mobility, so that there's no strain on the sternal area. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on sm smoking cessation, and then also supported coughing, which Renee already spoke about earlier. <laughs> um, we'll also introduce the Borg scale, which is a scale that actually tests your exertion with all your exercises and how tired they get. It's color coded and it's uh, basically part of three components, mild, moderate, and maximal intensity. It's also patient friendly so they can rate themselves. We'll introduce the incentive spirometer as well, the uses of it and how to use it. And we'll speak about the importance of mobilizing prior to surgery. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I, I think. Uh Dr. Chen's putting us all under pressure with uh, the time up sign. So I'm going to keep my talk uh, like a lady's miniskirt, long enough to cover the essentials, short enough to pique your interest. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about prehabilitation and specifically the nutritional component. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this slide, but just highlighting the metabolic response to surgery. We know that there's a rise in the inflammatory cytokines, and we know that the protein fat and glucose starts to become altered in its metabolism. Uh, specifically, we know that patients have insulin resistance, and this causes hyperglycemia. <coughs> Has anybody seen uh, this guideline for, on the ERAS website? I think Renee shared it with us sometimes. OK, so the part that uh, looks at prehabilitation, it's recommended for patients undergoing elective surgery with multiple comorbidities or significant deconditioning. There's a couple of points underneath there, but what, what really stands out to me are two parts. Firstly, significant deconditioning, and the second part, nutri nutrient optimization or nutritional optimization. So when we're looking at early signs of deconditioning, if you Google a, a definition, it talks about poor eating habits. And specifically to me, I interpret that as a poor nutritional status. The impact of nutritional status on surgery, we know that malnourished cardiac patients have poor wound healing, delayed weaning from mechanical ventilation, increased length of stay in the ICU, higher hospital costs, and ultimately higher mortality or shorter survival times. I just wanted to share a study that was done in Cape Town in an academic hospital. And it was talking about a term called hospital malnutrition. There's not many talks I do where 
I don't bring up this topic, and it's quite pertinent to, to the topic today. It was done in Cape Town, and they included a few other academic hospitals on the continent. And what they were looking was to try and figure out what is the incidence of hospital malnutrition? How many of our patients come to us in a poor or depleted state? Essentially, what they found on admission, 61% of the patients were classified as having a risk for malnutrition. And at discharge, this went up to 71%, telling us even in the academic settings, very little was done to treat this hospital malnutrition. These people are slipping through the cracks, and essentially, this is putting them at risk for poor outcomes. They also found that two in 10 of the patients that actually were classified as having malnutrition were actually referred to a dietitian for nutritional support. They also then went and looked at all the departments. And the ones that I've highlighted here is cardiac surgery. You'll see that cardiac surgery is no anomaly versus any other department. Around about 60% of the patients that presented to cardiac surgery were classified as having hospital malnutrition. The recommendations from the study was early screening is key. Timeless nutritional interventions is definitely recommended. And we need somebody monitoring these patients' intake versus what they require. And hence, the role of the dietitian becomes solidified. Malnutrition in cardiac surgery, we know that chronic cardiac failure, cardiac cachexia and sarcopenia, less functional and metabolic reserves, increased hemodilution, and various other factors predispose these cardiac surgery patients to malnutrition. We know that malnutrition equates to a worse outcome, but also we know that malnutrition equates to a less functional recovery of the patient. For any of us that have loved ones that have had surgery, one of the biggest things is getting them back to, I wouldn't say baseline functionality, but a normal functionality. And that is what we're essentially looking at. And that's where ERAS comes in. And it's not only about measuring morbidity and mortality, but also functionality of the patient. When we're looking at early preoperative nutritional intervention, the dietitian's role, there's quite a few there, but essentially it's nutritional screening tools. Uh, we have a very quick uh, tool that we use in our practice and some of the other practices use. It's called the NRS 2002. It measures what's the patient's BMI, have they lost weight recently, looking at sort of things like disease severity, and it also adds an extra point if your patient is over 70, because we know the elderly recover worse when it comes to surgery. This is just a tool from Duke University where they also look at, it's called the PONS, which is a pre-operative nutritional score. Again, looking at BMI, weight loss, intake, but they combine, as Fran mentioned earlier, the albumin. If the albumin is below 30, definitely looking at getting nutritional intervention in. If we look at the albumin data, it's, it's definitely a, a prognostic factor for complications after surgery, and it's also associated with impaired nutritional status. The albumin in combination with one of the other factors also warrants that patient being referred to a dietitian or being aggressively treated for a nutritional intervention. Still okay? Time up. Okay, time is up. Uh, just to touch on pre-op carb loading, uh, I think Dr. Brainbridge mentioned that as well. Essentially, we know that there's a huge issue of insulin resistance post-operatively. And the big thing is that when you treat them with uh, carbohydrates pre-operatively up to two hours before surgery, it's definitely going to help to improve that hyperglycemia. And that's it. Just in end, uh, nutrition plays a vital role in good surgical <laughs> outcome. Early pre-op screening is essential in correcting deficiencies. Uh, pre-op carb loading is, is recommended, but good precise nutrition equates to a better functional recovery for your patients. Thank you. You can see that I'm not the clever, so I have my notes here. But anyway, I don't think I'm gonna ever need it now, so let me put it away. Um, uh, I'm, I'm doing the intraoperative uh, anti fibrinolytic therapy. So for me to go ahead with that under Eris cardiothoracic surgery, they quoted a paper because they defined, basically in, in this category, they wanted to, we know that postoperative bleeding is a common uh, occurrence. And sometimes with a mess of bleeding will lead to an adverse outcome. So intraoperative, blood management or pre-operative, intraoperative, post-operative blood management is crucial. So during this e-race, they start thinking about how we notice that as well, that the, the, the scientific uh, uh, proven that if you reduce the red cell transfusion, it's actually beneficial to the patient. So therefore, 
through this journey, you need to start treating the preoperative anemia and you intraoperative and postoperative, you need to delineate what is a safe transfusion level for the patient underwent surgery with associated comorbidity and intraoperative blood salvaging and as well as monitoring postoperative uh, coagulation system. So therefore, in ERES, they quoted this paper. It's called Universal Definition of Perioperative Bleeding in Adult Cardiac Surgery. So this paper hypothesized. So basically what they did is that they break it down. Before they do that, they, they basically define these events uh, intraoperatively or postoperatively. Now, they use this nine category and define into five major categories. One is delay sternal closure. I need to speed faster. Postoperative chest tube output. Uh, Postoperative blood transfusion, intraoperative blood transfusion, FFP, platelet transfusion, quiet precipitate. Some of my partners will be quite familiar with these uh, transfusions. Uh, use a factor concentrate, use recombinate, activate factor seven. And lastly, surgical re-exploration. Now, they use this and define into five categories. Class one is insignificant, which is bled less than 600 mold in 12 hours. You will see none of those being used. Class two is mild, class three is moderate, class, class three is severe, and class four is massive, which is bled more than 2,000 over 12 hour period. Now, they basically uh, categorize the total number of patient that enrolled is 1,144, and 51% of them are class zero. Okay, and the massive is 1.6%. Now, uh, basically, out of this, they did an independent predictor. So basically, what it means is that when you have a higher euro score, you actually gen to generally fall into class two to class three because of multitude of comorbidities. Now, Preoperative hematocrit, you'll see that there's not a lot, but once you start getting to class two and class three, they generally are higher risk patients, so therefore the chance of bleeding are more. And these basically show three significant p-values. Basically, the longer bypass time, patients generally tend to bleed more. Now, the last uh, figures that demonstrated are actually showing that the number of patients basically accrue and adjusted. Crew it means all the patients that enrolled in there being put into these categories. But once you adjust it to all the risk factors and all that, leading to the, the operative mortality, you will realize severe to massive are significant because they are almost 9% contribute to mortality. Now, I went back to 2017 EX, which is a European guideline in terms of blood uh, management for adult cardiac surgery. It's quite a comprehensive document, tells you uh, the triggers, and, but I just want to focus on this category, what I'm talking about, which is antifibrinolytic agent. Now, Dr. Fulton had mentioned the class and then the level of evidence, and out of these all, the only thing that are really uh, class one and level A evidence are using transemic acid, a proteinin or EACA to use during the operation to decrease amount of blood loss. And under the ERES uh, suggestion, they will, they, they recommend 100 milligram per kg usage because if you go on a higher usage of uh, uh, cyclocapron, they're predisposed to post-operative seizure. And the others, which is what we have mentioned, they are class three, some of them class 2B, and, and not supported strongly with the evidence. So my conclusion is that cyclocapron usage can decrease intraoperative bleed and decrease potentially decrease the post-op blood transfusion. Thank you very much. Good morning, guys. My name is Dean Sheikh, um, one of my many, many, many roles at JJ&J. &J. 
includes scrubbing and wound care. As Dr. Play would say, I'm a minister without portfolio. So today I'm going to talk to you about SSIs. Um, we're going to just discuss the definition, classification, risk factors, sources, prevention measures, and SSI care bundles, taking into consideration ERAS. So basically the definition is infection that occurs after surgery in the part of the body where the surgery took place. So here we're looking at the midland stenotomy for open heart. Other sites include the drain site, which will be the anterior chest, so where your pleural drains, mediastinal or um, pericardial drains go into, laterally where we insert our intercostal drains, um, our minimally invasive surgery, so VATS, thoracoscopies, thoracotomies, and then our harvest vein site, so both forearms, radial sites, and lower leg, which will be our saphenous vein site. We also um, work around the um, femoral uh, area, the groin area, when we cannula uh, cannulate in for fem-fem bypass or if you're putting a patient onto ECMO. So that's also another site that we could get an SSI. So classifications, the causes could be external or internal. The internal would be your metabolic disorders, diabetes, cancer, uh, immunocompromised patients. Externals will be if a patient's receiving radiotherapy, um, trauma, or was involved in an accident, or could, could have acquired an infection in the operating theater. So your wounds depths are basically superficial, deep incision or organ, and we classify it uh, based on severity, so minor would, may have discharge, pus or infective serous fluid, but should not be associated with if, uh, sorry, excessive discomfort systemic signs such as pyrexia, or elevated CRP and PCT levels. Major would need secondary procedure, which would include uh, incision and drainage of abscess or wound debridement. Risk factors, um, our older patients above uh, 65 would um, have a problem with wound care, immunosuppressed patients, patients that are on ARVs, patients that are diabetic, uncontrolled diabetes, renal failure, malnutrition, patients that are underweight could um, be prone to hypothermia, P patients who smoke may have narrowing of the blood vessels which reduces the oxygen to the wounds and that would also affect the wound care, uh, anemic patients and steroid use, patients that are on long term steroids are at high risk of wound dehiscence, an operative factor, preoperative shaving as um, as um, indicated in the ERAS guidelines, preoperatively for our patients, we got a checklist where we'd shave the patient at 5 a.m. in the morning before the bath. Um, it must be an electrical clipper. Um, the length of the operation will also affect um, surgical site infection. Body temperature during surgery, we usually cool our patients down um, and then we reheat the patients. Postoperatively, moving the patient from the Table to the bed is important because patient can lose heat there. That's where our team comes in place and we make sure that the patients have a bear hugger or a warm blanket and being transferred from theater to ICU is very important to make sure that we retain the patient's heat. Foreign materials in the surgical site, if anything gets left behind in the patient, that's where we need to make sure that nothing gets left behind. Poor wound closure or breach in sterility. <clears throat> Sources of SSIs could be uh, exogenous, uh, contaminated hands, if us as scrub nurses don't wash our hands uh, the correct way or for the normal period of time. Instruments that are not sterilized correctly, it's important when we open up our sets to make sure that the instruments are sterile and implants such as our valves, if we're rinsing them for the correct amount of time in the antibiotic solution as prescribed. Um, endogenous source, which would be bacteria released into the wound from the patient's own skin flora when a surgical incision is made. Common microorganisms for SSI includes your staph present in the skin and the patient's nose, hence why with ERAS we uh, prescribe um, Bactroban intranasal for the patient the night before and the morning prior to surgery, thus reducing the staphylococcus um, areas um, infection in the patients. Streptococcus, which is bacteria commonly found on the skin or in the throat, pseudomonas, gram-negative bacteria, which can cause UTIs or wound infections, as well as E. coli, gram-negative bacteria that causes UTIs and gastroenteritis. 
EDAS guided preventative measures preoperatively would be to bath the patient. Patient should shower with Hebe scrub or chlorhexidine rather the night before surgery and 5 a.m. after the shave. Bowel or bladder preparation, shaving closer to the time using electrical clippers, I've mentioned that. Correct time of washing hands. Correct method of cleaning and draping the patient. Cleaning solution recommended chlorhexidine and follow a, sorry, a, a strict aseptic technique and maintain a surgical conscience throughout the procedure. Intraoperative correct theater temperature, 18 degrees Celsius. Um, maintain steril sterility throughout the procedure. Limit door movements in and out of the theater to prevent contamination. If there's two nurses working, sorry, <coughs> almost done. Post-operative, sorry, I'll just skip right to the bundles which is important, SSI bundles with EDAS, shower with hibiscus, I've mentioned that, pre-operative screening of MRSA, which will include the nasal and grain swabs, that will be done in the ward when we're prepping the patient prior to the surgery, a urine dipstick rather than an MR, sorry, than a urine MCNS. If there's anything abnormal on the dipstick, then we'll proceed to MCNS, as well as the intranasal Bactroban. Blood glucose levels to be controlled is important, temperature keeping the patient warm, antibiotics prophylaxis, which is cephalophorins, um, um, weight related, so calculated according to the patient's weight an hour prior to surgery um, and for the next 48 hours. If the surgery is longer than four hours, then the dose needs to be adjusted. And skin adhesives would include your dressings and CHGs as prescribed. Thank you. So my, my talk is on rigid sternal fixation. You'll, you'll realize so my first slide is actually, you're probably quite well aware, this is one of our patients that underwent a cardiac surgery. So median sternotomy is basically split the sternum in the midway and uh, uh, because that's the quickest and easiest access to the mediastinum structure. And uh, uh, for those patients underwent surgery, uh, it's like I always describe to them as a kind of artificial uh, fracture because we have created it. Iotogenic. So uh, through the literature, for the last 50 years, we've been taught differently. Uh, it's only the top pictures, which I'll go through just now. But uh, if you look at the right bottom figure, we've been taught using wires. And uh, um, the reason being is the cost. It's cost effective. It's easy to teach somebody to close chairs with the wires. And uh, uh, um, the rates of sternal infections are relatively low. Now, um, literature has documented the sternal infection rate is between 3% to 0.9%. So the rate is still very, very low. Now, recommendations. So I found this paper from NO of Thoracic Surgery. is a very, very good journal. Uh, they have done a randomized trial, which I will uh, elude it later. And basically, this is now the sternal closure. The top right, which is titanium plate, and those are uh, using, this is what we call rigid sternal fixation. So you can see the, the, uh, the, the CT scan pictures, you can see the, the, uh, the screw that's going through the sternum, and uh, at the bottom is the wires. Now, the wires on the left-hand side, basically, they are put on multiple. They, they, they are different techniques that have been applied in the literature to achieve a position of sternum. There's figure of A, there's single wires, and all that. So now, um, the randomized control trial actually gave you the best uh, so-called uh, uh, higher power in terms of evidence. And this is done in uh, one of the center in Chicago and then it's multi-centered. So part of it, what they did is that they actually, uh, um, the, they, they enrolled about 147 patients, or those are high-risk patients. I'll give you a demographic just now. And what they did is that they, uh, they assessed the patient preoperatively, postoperatively at three months and six months with a CT scan. Then they further divined the CT scan image into various categories. So the category A is no uh, uh, um, healing at all at sternum. B is uh, minimum. C is moderate. D is moderate healing. 
and E is partial um, synthesis of the bone, which you can see there's partial, and D is uh, complete. So they use this to further analyze their randomized control. So these are patients' characters that they uh, uh, randomize into two groups, which is a rigid plate fixation and uh, um, circular wire circuit. So that age is about 66 to, that's the, the mean. The body mass is greater than 30 kilogram per uh, meter square. They're quite obese actually. And then uh, they are diabetic, they're 69. They equally uh, matched. Renal failure, 27, COPD, and repeat stenotomy. So when you look at them, those are high-risk patients prone to develop uh, 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 sternal complications. So in this article, basically uh, they have identified those ones who had uh, a sternal, rigid sternal fixation. Sorry. Those ones underwent rigid sternal fixation. The, the sternum really healed at six months duration. In contrary to what we've been taught, six weeks patients can mobilize. So you can imagine that uh, they have done the study. Partial synthesis or, or moderate healing only occur at three months duration. So this is demonstrated by CT scan. So sometimes we tell patients that you can go back to do normal exercise up to six weeks duration. Sometimes it's still too early because if you're using wire saccharage, they still have mobilization or partial fibrosis of the sternum healing, and then they still experience pain. So um, now uh, this study also elucidates basically those ones with a rigid sternal fixation, postoperatively, pain reduction 25%. And as well as narcotic use, which is opiate use, decreased also by 25%. Therefore, I think this article are quite good. Now, I basically went on to uh, uh, find another meta-analysis. So basically, they look at three randomized control trial and five observational study. Now, the only problem for us as a cardiac surgeon is the cost because using wires are much cheaper compared to the sternal plating. Now we're looking at about 3,000 versus 26,000 rand. Okay? But in the meta analysis, the, the crucial fact is that early mortality, early, uh, early uh, complications, both wire and sternal plating are similar. But in terms of hospitalization, rigid plate fixation patients get to leave hospital much earlier. Therefore, in 2018, this paper, this is just the last figure I want to show you, is that they, they did a, a cost analysis. So with the, uh, with the wires, it cost them about uh, 20,000 US dollars, whereas rigid plate fixation is about 25. So the difference is about, um, or oh, 23, sorry. The difference is about $3,000, but postoperatively, when you start calling back three months to six months period, and when you start adding up the cost, basically the wires are become more expensive because they are more complication, pain, medication, and all that. And basically in three months, um, wire is $34,000, and whereas rigid play fixation is $32,000. So there's about $2,000 difference. So at the end of the day, ERES actually proposed using a, a, a rigid sternal fixation. Now, I just want to quickly show you the last slide. This is one of the uh, aortic valve that I've done, and I put a figure of eight. And you thought you have, and this patient returned after six weeks, and you think that you have complete healing. You can see the gap that's in between the sternum. Okay? So... Evocating maybe the cost of rigid plate fixations are much higher at initial, initially, but it is better for the patient. Thank you.
Okay, good morning, everybody. So, all familiar faces, you know that I stress about the kidneys. So, here we're looking at an interesting uh, topic, which is, I'm glad that it's making the debut here, is because that we are, we are well versed with conventional markers of kidney injury. So, what we're going to talk about here is what are novel new biomarkers of acute kidney injury. So just to set the scene, apart from renal replacement therapy, there's no direct treatment for acute kidney injury. So many researchers have argued that therapies could be translated from promising preclinical trials, and that if you know, patients could be identified at the very early stages, an intervention could be staged. Likewise, the clinicians argue that early treatment before irreversible kidney injury occurs um, they would be much more likely to succeed um, in reversing these injuries rather than you know, moving on to a more irreversible kidney injury. So what is the prevalence that we're dealing with? After cardiovascular surgery, about 5 to 10% of patients will develop kidney failure. It is a reality that we can't uh, minimize. The rates of the acute kidney injury by full KDGO criteria, they are much higher, um, approaching up to two, to three, two in three patients. So the rate between five and 10% is talking about uh, kidney failure requiring an intervention. The event of renal failure directly impacts on morbidity and mortality. And the current literature has demonstrated that post-cardiac surgery patients identified as high risk by biomarker testing uh, and randomized to a treatment had up to 34% reduction in your stage 2 to 3 acute kidney injuries compared to those patients that just had a normal standard of care. So when I you know, reference this um, prevalence here, and a much higher prevalence here. I'm really talking about how kidney injury, acute kidney injury is staged by the KDGO, which is your uh, international renal association. And we can see that what we're using really is just this most severe stage of kidney injury, whereby they're saying five to 10%. But if you encompass all kidney injury, including stages one, two, and three, you are likely to be um, encountering patients more frequently than we'd like. So the guideline uh, lists uh, 12 actions, six should be implemented in patients at high risk for acute kidney injury, and six are only intended for patients when an event occurs. Biomarkers are useful because they can be detected in blood of, or urine of patients before the, the um, AKI is evident using conventional criteria, example, changes in the urine output and serum creatinine. Just to note that change in the urine output is a very late sign of a kidney injury, and that an intervention at that point, if not sort of timed, is late already. Serum creatinine as well, if we look just at uh, the time frames that are, that are indicated here, you're looking at six to 12 hours, more than 12 hours, 24 hours, or anuria. That's very late in a patient's course post-surgery uh, to be picking this up. So there are a lot of novel markers that have been researched, including your uh, famous one, which is neutrophil gelatinase, lipocalin, kidney injury molecule, interleukin-18, but more recently, the tissue inhibitor metalloproteinase, which is abbreviated TIM2, and the insulin-like uh, growth binding factor, IGF, BP7, have been added to the list. And these are associated with varying degrees of uh, positive prediction. At the current time, there's only one biomarker test that's uh, approved by the FDA. It's available in uh, the United States as well as the United Kingdom, and it is a test which combines the TIM2 and IGF BP7, and it is called NephroCare, sold by the company Astute Medical. There was a meeting that was held um, on two occasions in Europe and the United States to 
assess from a panel of users of this particular test um, how one would devise a protocol and what were the questions that they would ask in the patients that they were looking after. And they've neatly grouped it up into four questions, which we'll go through now. So who are the target patients for a nephrocheck test? Um, we can see that they've classified it in tier one and tier two, and right up here, the first patient in tier one is your patient. Post-operative cardiac cardiovascular surgery, the other ones are patients in shock who are hemodynamically unstable, sepsis features, post-operative from major non-cardiovascular -cardio surgery, and then patients with other uh, injuries, including cardiac arrest and uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Tier two has got a list of other critically ill patients. So timing is important here. So we're looking at um, timing of a test whenever the kidney is thought to be under threat, whether it's hemodynamic instability, the recognition of a toxic event, the question of secondary nephrotoxicity, or at any time really where the significant change in the status has occurred that might result in an acute kidney injury. Uh, it's particularly useful in the first 72 hours of an ICU admission However, in the context of a post-cardiac uh, surgery patient, um, usually it's tested within four hours of cardiac surgery. So they've identified two time points, post-cardiac surgery, where the test would be the most helpful in identifying a at-risk patient. Uh, there are two peaks within four hours. The first is postulated to be the time of acute kidney stress and uh, the second peak occurs usually in the early post-operative period, and both measurements at this time combined have a good predictive uh, probability. So for patients who have the additional problem of septic shock, uh, testing is sort of out of a timeline frame saying that as soon as possible. Okay. So, just to give us an indication, because we haven't really used this test, what is interpreted or as a positive test, we can see that the FDA has used a cutoff threshold of more than 0 0.3, which tells you that more than 92% of all stage 2 to 3 AKA, uh, AKI events would be predicted with that uh, value. So if your test is less than 0 0.3, it's defined as low risk moderate risk between 0.3 to 0.2, and a high risk of more than two. The importance here is that a test result um, of more than 0.3 helps us to make um, changes or actions that would be based on the test that would be beneficial to the patient. So I'm just gonna go through some of these. Um, what are the priority actions that uh, could be taken? They fell into two main domains. The first was management of nephrotoxins, and the second was management of fluids. So to discontinue all non-essential nephrotoxins, including your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, we avoid use of vancomycin, especially combinations with aminoglycosides, as well as uh, piperacil and tazobactam and to continue, discontinue angiotensin-converting enzymes, or ARBs. These were, were ranked second and fourth. Goal-directed fluid management uh, was ranked third, and retaining invasive hemodynamic monitoring was ranked seventh. So I th thought it's important to mention here that a negative test result is seen as just as informative as a positive result because low-risk patients then may benefit from those treatments that you're avoiding in your high-risk patients. For example, your non-steroidals. Um, there was also a strong consensus that patients with a negative uh, test were good candidates for fast-track therapies or de-escalation protocols, which included, for example, removing your, your invasive lines and your indwelling catheters, because their risk of acute kidney injury was so much less. This picture is meant to look scary,
but you know they've just highlighted the varying uh, sort of movement in terms of time post AKI event and severity of uh, kidney injury. Once again, just highlighting in a nice diagram uh, how one would, in a stepwise uh, fashion, implement changes with a positive result and how one would de-escalate patients with a negative result. So as with any new technology, there's potential barriers to adopting it. Okay. Um, the main one here is cost effectivity. Just to highlight that um, you know, for one test, we're currently at 100 US dollars. Um, it's commercially available in uh, some parts of the world. Uh, we don't really have exposure to it here, but there is a company that has the uh, access to it. So perhaps in the future. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so delirium screening and ERAS. Delirium is an acute confusional state characterized by a fluctuating mental state inattention, either altered level of consciousness or um, disorganized thinking. It's been described as also having underlying inflammation, even neuronal damage um, that's going on. And at the center of delirium, you've actually got a vulnerable brain. And just this week, I've seen an article that describes delirium as being an emergency when it happens. The longer it goes on, the more severe it is and the more trouble the brain is in. So they equate delirium to brain failure and an emergency. So why do we screen? Well, between 50 to 80% of our cardiac surgery patients actually have delirium, and it often goes undiagnosed, okay? And then it's associated with morbidity, mortality, and a prolonged length of stay. In one to eight cases, it's preventable. And in one in five cases, Never, the patient never goes back to baseline. So what's the point of restoring our cardiac, our respiratory, our renal function, and the patient, when they go home, they're not the same person. Okay, they, don't, they just exist. Okay, so they have a brain failure. Right, so who's at risk? Because we uh, are told we need to screen for risk before, so it's preoperatively. So if they are aged, they have diabetes, current mild cognitive impairment, if they have a coronary artery stenosis, and if they have preoperative antipsychotics, that's an independent risk factor, as well as your statins, your antihypertensives, anticholinergics, antidepressants, benzos, and opioids. And intraoperatively, if they have fentanyl or ketamine, they're also at high risk of developing delirium. So um, there's obviously post-operative things that also put our patients at risk. But um, in our ICU setting, what we're going to use uh, every shift is RAS and then CAM. So they never go separate from each other. You have to see whether their agitation score is adequate for us to now assess for delirium. So if they're deeply sedated, if you look at minus four at the bottom there, or they're unrousable, minus five, then it's pointless to do the screening in the first place. Okay, so anything from combative to moderate sedation, you'd then start screening for delirium. And there's a few other tools that you could use, but in the literature, most um, accurate is the CAM ICU. The limitations to that is if the patient's got a hearing impairment, so just put their hearing aids in. And also, if they can't speak English, you'll see if you go on in the screening how relevant that is. If you don't have an speak, uh, English-speaking patient, use an um, interpreter. Okay. So you'll see that number one, two, three, four, five are those distinguishing characteristics that I spoke to in the beginning if they have acute change or fluctuating course of mental status, um, then uh, you'd have to screen. And if they have that, they already are, yes, they probably have delirium. Uh, if they don't have that, then you, you stop there at that screen, then you, they don't have delirium. 
Then if they're inattentive, you're going to have to screen for inattention. They have to squeeze your hand. You'll see a video now. And if they have more than two errors, then they are probably delirious. Okay. Then you go on to altered level of consciousness. See if that is um, relevant to them. If they are not, as in on their RAS, it says there, then, then you would already um, then go down to the next one because now you have to look at disorganized thinking. But if they're anything other than a naught on your rest, they have cam, they have delirium. Okay, so this is a short two minute clip. Uh, I'm going to give you a demo today about how to do the confusion assessment method in the ICU, the cam ICU for an intubated patient. So we have our patient here. Um, the first step in, in identifying delirium would be, does our patient have a fluctuating course? And I have heard from report that my patient has had some agitation over the past 24 hours, so I'm going to assess her. Mrs. Smith, hi there. I'm going to ask you to do a few things for me in order for me to see how your thinking is. Can you squeeze my hand? Good. I'm going to ask you to squeeze my hand every time I say the letter A. So when I say A, what will you do? Good. S, A, B, E, A, H, A, A, R, T. So she squeezed my hand on every A except for one. So I could say that she passed and she does not have delirium. Now we'll start over with a different patient. Mrs. Jones, hi there. I'm going to ask you to do a few things for me to see how your thinking is. Can you squeeze my hand? Good. I'm going to ask you to squeeze my hand every time I say the letter A. So when I say A, what will you do? Good. S. A, B, E, A, H, A, A, R, T. She squeezed my hand too many times at different letters, so I'm going to keep going. Mrs. Jones, I'm going to ask you some questions. Can you say yes or no? Nod your head, yes or no. Does a stone float on water? Are there fish in the sea? Okay, so you'd go on um, at the bottom there, you'd look at disorganized thinking with a few more questions. And if they are delirious, then you need to manage that. You can't just screen and get a positive delirium and that's it, you write it on the chart and ignore it. Okay, um, these screening tools we have at MediClinic in the back of our charts, but often in the other, um, Hospitals, they don't, so you need to acquire these screening tools to um, help the patient. These are the quick uh, screens, but they're not as accurate. Okay, so um, if you're going to manage this uh, delirium, you, you actually are going to be using all your protocols for ERAS, and you'll see that they feed into delirium, as in helping um, patients come out of delirium or prevent the delirium. Okay. Um, and this is just a protocol from Portsmouth. You can see it's really comprehensive, but um, it helps with, uh, if you have a look, you have to manage and prevent pain. You have to do awake and breathing trials. You have to choose your sedation and your analgesia wisely, uh, assess and prevent and manage your delirium and mobilize your patients. So you'll see it's a lot of our stuff already feeds into helping patients with delirium. So the take home is, Delirium equals brain failure equals an emergency. Screen every shift. Prevention is actually easier than cure. And every element of ERAS protocol actually counts for delirium. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thanks so much for your time. My name is Jackie Mitchell. I'm a physio, and I'm going to be talking about early mobilization. Early mobilization has proven itself in countless studies and many contexts to be effective. Um, it speeds up patients' recovery after surgery, it enhances the patient's mood, 
it reduces complications post-op and reduces ICU and hospital stay. And amazingly, those are exactly the same things that we're aiming for in, in ERAS. So I put it to you today that early mobilization is a very critical point in this pathway. And it definitely is a pathway, as we can see. Um, I'm talking about point 18 um, out of 20 on this particular slide. Um, and this pathway, this chain reaction, um, has been put together by each individual and each multidisciplinary team to bring us to this critical point of getting out of bed as soon as possible. And so, um, even starting in pre-op education where the patient has been um, prepped that they're going to be getting out of bed early, they know that, they expect that. Um, along the pathway, um, Dr. Kilpatrick would have spoken just now about being extubated within six hours um, of the operation in order to get out of bed early. And then along, also along the path, we've got opoid sparing analgesia so that the patient is awake, ready, and able and safe to mobilize early. And so I say this um, because nurses and physios, we don't want to drop the ball here. Everything's been prepped, everything's been primed. We need to get them moving as soon as possible. Let's not delay. So what is the plan? How early is early? This is an excerpt from our patient booklet, which Renee will talk about. We want to, if the patient is back in good time from theatre, we would like them to get out of bed and sit in the chair on day zero, the day of the operation. Obviously, if they're stable, if they're safe, okay? <laughs> Blowing a few brains here. Um, so that is the plan. Day one post-op, the patient must be out of bed. Um, we want them to sit in the chair for two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and we would like them to be walking on day one. Um, we can walk with the drains. We can. We can walk with an A-line. It just requires some teamwork, which we've got, so it will be fine. Um, in the past, say 12 months ago, we did not mobilize the patient on day zero because they were still ventilated and sedated. We did not mobilize the patient on day one because sometimes they were still ventilated or still drowsy from the sedation or still got a lot of opioids swimming around in their system. Um, but everything has shifted earlier. And so the time to mobilize has shifted as well. Um, so we don't need to be scared because everything has, has moved along with our expectation. Um, we need to extend our comfort zone, as Dr. Fulton said right at the beginning. And we're already seeing it happen. Um, we're already seeing patients getting out of bed much, much earlier, day one. They're doing well. It's, it's not a problem. It's good. Um, if not, why not? So in the, in the booklet, there's a little section where the patient, assisted by the nurse, will be ticking, did they sit in the chair that day, yes or no? And then there's a section that says, if not, why not? And there are a number of reasons why the patient might not achieve this goal. Um, they might be unstable. Um, they might have uncontrolled vomiting, lots and lots of, of, of real reasons. Um, but may it never be because the physio or the nurse is unprepared to make it happen. Let's prepare ourselves, let's prepare the patient, the, the visitor that's there, um, let's prepare the, the bedside, let's make sure that the IV lines are long enough so we can do what we're wanting to achieve. Um, the mobilization aims also increase as the days go on, so we need to keep up with, with the aims in the booklet, um, leading to a time when they, they're climbing a flight of stairs. Um, so it's important to keep up with those aims. And let's also make sure when the patient's in the cardiac ward that the, the patient's also getting out of bed and spending more of their waking hours sitting up than lying down. Because we can be so on top of it in the ICU, but then we change the ward and then um, that can get lost. So early mobilization is key to the success of the ERAS protocol. So let's have, make it happen. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carmen, physio. Um, I'm going to be talking about incentive spirometry. 
Um, so yeah, this looks like something you would blow into, but it's actually, you've got to pull the air in. Um, so what do we do? We've got to, or what's the purpose? We've got to teach the patient to sustain a slow, deep breath. Um, a more technical term would be a sustained maximal inhalation, um, which is a slow, deep inspiration from functional residual capacity up to total lung capacity. So once you've breathed out, that would be your functional residual capacity. And then you take a deep breath in to your total lung capacity. So the benefits of incentive spirometry is to prevent atelectasis or collapse of alveoli, to assist in lung hygiene. Um, it's an objective measure for the practitioner and for uh, the positive feedback for the patient. So the practitioner and the patient can monitor the patient's progress. You get two different types of incentive spirometers. The one I've got today is the volume orientated one. Um, it's got a one-way valve. You also see the, the tri-flow device or the flow orientated device. Um, that's the one with the three canisters. Um, it's been proven that the uh, volume orientated one, the one with the red ball, is better than the, the tri-flow device. Um, the work of breathing is less and um, it tends to engage the diaphragm better. So um, the method to use the incentive spirometer, um, the patient must be in a relaxed position, either sitting upright or in side lying. So if you wanted more volume um, on one of the lungs, say you had a left lower lobe collapse, you could position the patient in left side lying, so on the worst lung, um, and then they would do the incentive spirometry while in side lying. Um, you would ask the patient to exhale, form a tight seal around the mouthpiece, inhale slowly and deeply, raising the ball from the bottom of the canister. You'd want them to watch the flow meter, so you would see that the ball is actually rising up to the top of the canister, um, ideally, they need to sustain the inhalation for five seconds and then they would um, do an inspiratory hold for five seconds, so hold their breath to keep the airway open for longer. Um, they would then relax the seal around the mouthpiece, exhale, resume normal breathing and then repeat. And you'd want to do it ten times per waking hour. So I'll demonstrate now. So you'd want to do something, and exhale, and exhale. So there's a whole bunch of um, indications, um, pre-op screening, the presence of atelectasis, um, Conditions predisposing to atelectasis, like abdominal or thoracic surgery, prolonged bed rest, surgery in patients with COPD, presence of thoracic or abdominal binders, lack of pain control. Um, you'd use it in presence of neuromuscular disorders or spinal cord injury, restrictive lung disease involving dysfunctional diaphragm or respiratory muscles, or patients with inspiratory capacity of less than two and a half liters. So, Practically, with the incentive spirometer, you'd want to choose a setting that the patient can hold the ball up for at least two seconds. Um, so you'd want to get a, a volume of close to two liters at least. Um, your contraindications, the patient's unable to use the device, if they're non-compliant or very young, or have developmental delays, they're hyperventilating, or if you um, have to interrupt their oxygen supplementation and they desaturate, you shouldn't really do that. Um, they're fatigued, severe dyspnea, heavily sedated or comatose. And obviously it's not, can't be used as the only treatment for lung collapse or consolidation. Um, if they use the impro improper technique, 
can result in hyperventilation, um, can cause barrier trauma and emphysema, uncontrolled pain, it's obviously uncomfortable, and if the airways are hyperreactive, can cause bronchospasms. Thank you. So, glycemic control is a five-hour talk, not a five-minute talk, so we can only just touch the, the, a, a couple of things. Um, diabetics are not like ordinary people. They have big problems, both intra-op and uh, post-op. And only some of these things we can um, make a difference with, with our management. Um, the, the, most of the damage that, they've, uh, that they have has already been done by the time they get, they get to the, the, the theater. But we can not make it worse by, with our management. Um, as, as, as was pointed out earlier, um, once you get an HbA1c of over 6.5, then your risk goes up of, of surgery. The trouble is that getting the HbA1c down below that means that the patients have got to be diagnosed earlier and they've got to have some kind of treatment. And we still get patients coming in needing urgent surgery that can't wait for, for that time. So um, these are patients that are already at, at, at high risk. Um, the other big thing is that there's a big difference between insulin-dependent diabetics and uh, type 2 diabetics who are not insulin-dependent. Um, the type 2 don't have nearly the problems that the, uh, that the insulin-dependent diabetics have. Um, so the, the, I'd like to go back to what I was saying before, is that we, we're talking about errors here. We're trying to improve the outcomes that, that our patients are having. But there's a lot of basic stuff that we're not getting right at the moment. It's still happening that we're putting patients in ICU that when we go and ask what's happening about the, the, the sugar control, the nurse looking after the patient doesn't have a protocol to look after the patient, either because they haven't been printed or because she's never heard of the protocol. Um, and this, this is a disastrous state of affairs. So that, you know, it's very important that for the seniors, again, to be keeping an eye on someone who's looking after a cardiac patient but is new and doesn't know the, doesn't know the story. Um, as far as glycemic control is concerned, it starts before we take a patient to theatre. Um, the first thing is that a, a, a patient who is on insulin um, requires insulin and sugar the whole way through their, their course because otherwise they'll go into ketoacidosis. And ketoacidosis is a disaster. So those patients, even if they're not eating anything, if they're on a long-acting insulin, they should get their long-acting insulin. Even if they are being starved from midnight to theater, they need to have some of their long-acting insulin to keep them out of ketoacidosis. The second thing is diabetic patients need to be done early in the day so that they're not spending hours and hours and hours without any sugar intake. Um, during the, their... Uh, um, operation, that's relatively easy because we've got them on an uh, insulin infusion. Once they get to ICU, yeah, people make mistakes. If, if you're taking over a patient in ICU and you look down and you see that the patient is still on 10 units an hour of insulin, you need to ask why, because it's most likely that the anesthetist has forgotten to reduce, uh, while, the, while the patient's on bypass, the, sh the sugar goes up through the roof. When they're off bypass, then their insulin requirements go right down. And if he has left the insulin running at 10 mils an hour, then you're going to have a hyperglycemic patient on your hands. Um, the the post-op control is all about not doing damage to your patient. Hypoglycemia is much more dangerous than hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia gets, causes all the problems that we've heard about, about infections, chest infections, sternal wound infections, uh, all of that stuff. But hypoglycemia is what's going to kill your patient or leave the poor guy with no brain for the rest of his life. So you need to be very vigilant about, number one, um, if you change from TPN or 
nasogastric feeding to something where he's not getting anything, you need to watch your insulin because if he's getting an insulin infusion and he's on TPN and then they stop the TPN because they can't get any from the pharmacy or whatever it is, he's going to go hyperglycemic. Okay? Um, and then the other important uh, thing is that you need to have a plan from all the way through. If, he, if, if you're now going to transfer your patient to the ward, um, you must have a plan of what's going to happen to his insulin and his management from ICU to the ward. It's no good having a patient that's on, say, an insulin infusion in the ICU, and now you're going to send him to the ward. Uh, his sugars, you, it's going to undo all the good work that you've done over the last two, three days if you don't have a plan of, of moving ahead into the ward. And then the only last thing is because of the danger of hypoglycemia, the targets that we're looking for in the ICU these days are much laxer than they were before. Where, where, where before we were looking at a sugar of six, we found that those patients are much more likely to get hypoglycemic and have problems than if we relax the requirements to anywhere between five and 10. If you can keep your sugars between five and 10, then your patients won't have any problems. You got me again. Um, this is also going to be short, but not quite as short as the last one. And with all of these topics, you, you can spend a whole symposium, like uh, glucose management perioperatively. The idea is to try and make it um, fairly rational, straightforward, that will cover 80 to 85% of your open heart surgery patients. So optimal use of blood products in cardiac surgery. There was a, a lot of debate about whether you were liberal or whether you're um, restrictive in transfusing patients um, perioperatively. And people used to target a hemoglobin of 10. Um, and then they started producing you know, evidence-based medicine again, which gets in the way of all of our, our Dunning-Kruger moments where we kind of just do what we like. Um, and in this particular study published in the New England Journal in 2017, um, they were able to show a restrictive blood transfusion strategy wasn't inferior to uh, a, a more liberal blood transfusion strategy. Um, you know, and they, they targeted uh, a hemoglobin of 7.5. Um, and then this is an earlier study, transfusion re uh, requirements after cardiac surgery. This is a controlled trial. Again, restrictive perioperative strategy is um, not inferior to a more liberal. And there's lots of new evidence coming out unrelated to that. And then they just looked at the variation in blood transfusion and coronary artery bypass surgery. And you can see in the uh, graph at the top, that there's a massive variation uh, across the board because everybody's kind of doing what they like to do. Um, and this particular graph just shows that a reduction in transfusion um, in the SDS database uh, over a, peer, a reduction rate of 1.1 to 3.1 percent per year, which is really slow in spite of good evidence to show that we should be more restrictive. And if you see in the top right, what is the time lag in translational research? And it's 17 years. Now, doctors are supposed to be very clever, but we take 17 years to learn something. And, you know, the benefits are, are quite clear. So what should we do? Oxygen transfer is unaffected until the HB reaches 7.2. We know that from the ECMO literature, and we know that now from the hematology literature Platelet function is adequate at 80. Um, there's all these preoperative antiplatelet agents that you need to take into account when you're ordering blood, the clopidogrels and the pressure grills and the agrostats. You know, you, that you get when you see the patient. And then are they on other anticoagulants, the novel oral anticoagulants, warfarin and heparins, clexane, erextra, etc. So what should you do before you take the patient to surgery? If you can, you must optimize. And we all use that word, optimize their you know, hematological status. 
and withhold appropriately. Um, anti, you know, the antiplatelet agents, clopidogrel, etc., should be withheld for a minimum of five days before surgery. And you can do a, a thromboelastogram, or you can do a platelet function assay to see if the platelets aren't still, still working. But just because they've been on it doesn't mean they need platelets. And the same thing with warfarins and novel anticoagulants, you've got to be off for three days before surgery. A heparin, you've just got to stop them the night before. Um, and uh, order product appropriately. And the idea is to, to cross-match and stand by, and what we should be endeavoring to do is get the blood bank to, to work with us. Um, a lot of the, the blood product orderings can depend upon the type of surgery. You know, routine, again, we're talking about routine, straightforward, open heart surgery, aortic valves, mitral valves, mitral valve repair, uh, coronary artery bypass grafting, which makes up 90% of our surgery. The other groups, like aortic dissections, infective endocarditis, septic patients, shocked patients, and the cath lab cases, the cath lab catastrophes, they are different. You've got to, you can be more liberal with uh, ordering your, your blood products. And I, I put this up just so, I hope you can all see it, but it gives you an idea of, of what it costs. I mean, a single red cell concentrate, um, including that, is two and a half thousand rand. If it's leukodepleted, which is what we should be ordering for our patients, because leukodepleted blood is free of a lot of the antigens that cause the blood reactions, that's 4,100 rand. Um, a single uh, unit of platelet concentrate um, is an, uh, it's leukocyte depleted is 11,900. If it's a single donor, apheresis is 13,000 and pooled is 10,000 rand. Uh, whole blood um, leukodepleted is 3,800. Uh, cryoprecipitate is 1,200, 1,400 rand. Fresh frozen plasma is 1,600 rand, um, and forget about the filters. It's a lot of money. So every time that we uh, see an open heart surgery patient and we're ordering the blood, we must look at what the hemoglobin, what's your target hemoglobin? Most patients, you can, with a hemoglobin of 12 and above, you can do the surgery without giving them any blood products. And what you do intraoperatively is very important, as I've discovered, because stuff gets done that you're not aware of. And we've got to think about that and why. Well, apart from the fact that we're a country that doesn't have blood, and we've been short of blood a couple of times this year, so we can't do any open heart surgery cases, we shouldn't be wasteful of blood and blood products either, because it's expensive. You can throw away 40,000 rands worth of blood products if you order them and don't use them. And just giving them, is also not the, the right thing to do. Um, so there's, there's ways for us to be better. And there's a lot in the literature now about um, transfusion-related lung injury. The lung is becoming central to everything now, especially ECMO ventilation. And the lung is easily injured by any foreign antigen. So I think that for a normal bypass patient, you can order two units of blood and nothing else. And that should be all you need if the hemoglobin is above 12. And we're using cell saving. And this is better for the patient. We all have there's problems with the blood bank, etc. But I think that we've got to improve that in order to make it better for our patients. The patients have less infections. They have less renal dysfunction. They have less pulmonary dysfunction. So we've got to try and you know, implement the, the ERAS type drive as well minimize um, you know, exogenous proteins to our patients. Rather stick with clear fluids as much as we can. Thank you. OK. My topic today is like the best one. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk today about goal-directed fluid therapy. I think everybody knows how passionate we are about cardiac output monitoring in our practice. and. Although this is goal-directed fluid therapy, it includes inotropes as well. It's all about hemodynamic monitoring. I've shown this before many times at all our journal clubs and all the other opportunities we have, but you'll see that um, goal-directed fluid therapy is in the second best evidence there, the fourth one, 
and it is recommended to reduce post-operative complications. This is from the ERAS cardiac website, and I hope everyone is looking at it here and there now and then. Okay, so the main points, goal-directed therapy utilizes monitoring techniques to help guide clinicians with administering fluids, vasopressors, and inotropes to avoid hypotension and low cardiac output. The first cardiac surgery patient I was involved in in this region, the senior sister came up to me and said, please don't put that on, we just know when to put fluids. And I was quite taken aback. I think we've come a long way since that conversation, and I hope that you can see how dynamic our care needs to be. We need to move with the trends. We need to use the technology available to us, and we need to understand what to do with the information on the cardiac output monitor. If you're working with open heart surgery patients, you, you really shouldn't be accepting that allocation without knowing cardiac output. Well, it's quite a big thing to say. But you should be an adult learner and take that step and attend a cardiac output workshop or YouTube something great. We've recorded one. Surgical Innovations and JJ and J hosted a cardiac output workshop and I think we perhaps need another one. We need continuous learning. But please, that should be like number one on your personal skills plan, okay, is to understand this part. You don't have to guess whether you should go up with your vasopressors, your inotropes, or give fluid. This information is at your fingertips on algorithms. And you will save your patients a hell of a lot of extra fluid that's unnecessary. I cannot wait to show you guys the data that we collected from last year to see just how much fluid these patients were getting. So, what, what is this about? So using a cardiac output monitor to direct fluid and inotrope administration. So for fluids, we're looking at these values, CVPs. You have to transduce your CVP. We need SVV, PPV, and this new one, JEDI, like Star Wars. We'll tell you all about it in the cardiac output workshop. Five minutes is certainly not enough. For inotropes, we look at things like cardiac index, and for our vasopressors and vasodilators, we're looking at SVRI, our systemic vascular resistance. Before you go to the cardiac output machine, you need the theory on cardiac output. And this will all come right. It's like going through the matrix. You'll suddenly have an aha moment, and you'll see a huge change in the way that you look after these people. This wonderful machine that we are using has also got a PICO and a thermodilution function, which also gives us extravascular lung water index, which we can quickly pick up pulmonary edema before an X-ray, which is a fantastic thing to have on a cardiac patient. And then we've already mentioned part of not choosing the right fluid is to decide whether to give blood transfusions or not. And even though we said 7.5 is when it becomes clinically significant and a low HB, on our protocols, our trigger is eight. Okay, so what happens if you don't get this part right? If you just carry on with that's how, we all, we all think that we have a gut feeling. We've been working with these patients for many years. We know gel effusion will work now. Yes, it will, but here are the consequences. You're gonna have a patient that's overloaded. If you don't give enough inotrope or too much, you can also get multi-organ failure. But in our trend, which we've, we've shown, and I'll show you the data a little bit later, we're definitely on the side of overloading and too much fluid. You can have a puffy edematous patient that does not want to mobilize, that is uncomfortable, that sometimes even has a GI issue. They're gonna be nauseous, they're not gonna to wanna to eat. It delays all the recovery. We've had also, I think it was more than 30% of our post-op cardiac surgery standard normal patients having to receive wall CPAP or some sort of NIV afterwards. The only NIV that you should be giving them is the spirometry, the only positive pressure. It's really abnormal to give a cardiac open heart surgery patient CPAP. That should really be you know, an exception. And probably the most important is infection control. As soon as you've got wet pulmonary edematous lungs, 
there comes the infection next. So they can't cough properly, they're overloaded, there's a wonderful environment for our bugs to grow, and we know what's happening in our ICUs. There's two um, tools that we also use. We've got the real life one there next to the cardiac output monitor. If you're not sure about this, just come and come past during lunchtime. We've got also some reps here from Surgical Innovations, and I know a lot of you have seen these before. There's some normal values and definitions of all these factors, and then also a very handy hemodynamic decision model. And this is what they're talking about with goal-directed care, using these kinds of tools, not just winging it on your gut, oh, gel's gonna work now. Okay. That's that. Please attend a cardiac output workshop. Right, so multimodal analgesia. Um, I just want to point out this is one of the 22 odd care bundles for ERAS. Um, and it's a component that's it's not just post sort of post operatively. Um, intra op is a component of that already, and it does flow into each other. So going forward, so this is lifted directly off the ERAS website. So essentially, we know we need to go easy on the opioids. There are a whole host of issues with them. I'm not going to read through all of those, but the the mainstay of this is to try and reduce our opioid use. And it's not just the side effects of the opioids. Um, there are two other big issues. It's post-operative opioid use, which is a huge thing in the States now. So we've got an incidence of patients that are lifelong opioid users afterwards. We're probably looking at almost 20%. And then obviously other issues with the development of chronic pain. So the one plays off against the other. We need to treat the pain adequately, but high-dose opioids have their own effects. So going forward then, um, just in the interest of time here, so the slide's been up here before today, but we're looking at the evidence base. So this is the American Medical Association, the JAMA um, Journal, and it, it's really easy actually, because it comes down to these four things. So the evidence base looks at acetaminophen or paracetamol here, tramadol, dexmedetomidine, presidex, and then gabapentin. So those four agents are the ones for which there is an evidence base and what, basically we should be employing these. So obviously anti-inflammatories are still out with the renal and thrombotic dysfunctions, and we're left with these four things to incorporate into our use. So obviously there, I just want to sort of highlight initially already that our dexmedetomidine is instituted in theater as part of the operation that gets carried on until the extubation, so that's a component of it. The gabapentin gets used prior to the induction of anesthesia, so that's one of the pre-meds. So, you know, th these four agents that are here, they are a continuum from pre, intra, and post up. So obviously there's four there, and it's, it's nice to have these guidelines, but where are the practical protocols that go through? So this is a, a Boston study, and they essentially, I mean, they're looking at the reduction in opioid use, and the, the outcomes aren't really important. If you use less, you know the outcomes are going to be good, and I think there was a 50% reduction in opioid use. But what was interesting to me is how they went about doing it. And here, again, what I'd like to highlight, it's not an isolated post-operative issue here. Our pre-operative issue with the use of paracetamol and gabapentin, intra-operative reduction in fentanyl, and additionally, the use of local anesthesia, which, you know, by and large in cardiac surgery doesn't get employed, certainly not for the bypass at this point, the Presidex, as I've mentioned, and then again, all those post-operative uses. So specifically with their study, the way they went about this and that seemed fairly elegant to me. So the paracetamol gabapentin, a reduction in opioid use, and the anesthetists in the room will know that 500 mics of fentanyl is not a lot. Um, we're routinely using 1,000 to 2,000 for most of the cases or equivalents in fentanyl or the other agents. And again, there is going to be an overlap here specifically with the fast track um, anesthesia, extubation with six hours. The anesthesia protocols will incorporate lower doses of opioids. And, in a lot of ways, this is a historical hangover from the early 60s where anesthesia for cardiac surgery was a high opioid-based anesthesia. And the reasons for that, obviously, the induction agents had their own cardiac issues. So this is still a legacy of anesthesia from the 60s, essentially. And again, I'm not going to go through that whole protocol, but what was interesting there is obviously, the, as I mentioned before, the use of local anesthesia as an adjunct to this. There's not one specific silver bullet here we're still very limited in the number of drugs we can use if you just think that it's the Presidex, the GABA, the Tramadol, and the Paracetamol. Um, 
and obviously, we're not taking away the opioids post-operatively. As I mentioned earlier, chronic pain is a feature of cardiac surgery patients, and the single most important thing is to adequately treat the analgesia. So with that, we have the sort of codeine derivatives and then still the intravenous opioids as part of the ICU protocol. What we don't want, though, is not to have any of these others and just an opioid-based ICU stay. Right, so it's quite simple, actually. It's quite straightforward, again, in limited time. Obviously, there are controversies, all right? It's, you know, this is the implementation. We saw the same with the surviving sepsis guidelines. There were issues with that afterwards. And there are some here. Um, this is quite an interesting paper to look at, which I'm not going to go through in its entirety, but it looks at the, all the individual components um, and what issues there are with them. But it is interesting. So at the time of preparing for this paper, I got this email, which I normally ignore. Um, it's from the Health Professions Council, so that's probably why. But I'd looked at basically at the, the gabapentin and the gabapentinoids. And reading into it, they've had real issues with two things, predominantly sedation and respiratory difficulty. Um, and there is a follow-on from that. So, you know, I did a bit more digging, and there's this paper that came out in 2020 in anesthesiology. And it basically looked at meta-analysis of gabapentin, that whole class. And the very sort of short answer of that is it causes sedation and no real analgesic benefit. So I think we're going to be in a position now where we had three or four, well, four agents. We're going to be down to three. So this is probably going to be withdrawn owing to the fact that, especially in the context of what we're trying to achieve here, which is rapid extubation or early extubation where appropriate, you're going to have a hangover of sedation and other issues, and that is going to impair our fast-track protocol. So I think even though it is still on the ARIS website, within a year or two, we're going to see that withdrawn from um, where we are with our thing today. And that is hopefully on time. There you go. Uh, all right, Strombo. Thrombo profile. Oh, that's why this file was so big. There's a video there. I was trying to figure it out. It's only got three pictures. Um, uh, let me quickly have it. I'm sure we've all seen uh, a patient suddenly die in the ward and suddenly fall over, and then nobody knows what's going on, and we all CPR'd them, or they've fallen over in the toilet. And then they just die, and we all think, and then the doctors and the resource team go, it must be a pulmonary embolus, because we don't know. And I think we, it, it's a hell of a scary thing, and it's something we really need to think about. So cardiac surgery is an independent risk factor in terms of creating a hypercoagulable state and causing deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolus. So we've got to do something to stop this. It's not rocket science, but you can see if, uh, if a big clot shoots up into the heart and into your pulmonary artery and blocks the entire thing, that is a sudden stop and drop situation. And the only thing that can really help there is eCPR with VA ECMO. Uh, and those patients usually die. Then you get pulmonary attacks, like a heart attack, but a pulmonary attack. So it's all a lung stroke. And, and that causes a whole bunch of other problems, predisposes patients to a whole lot of things. So what can we do? Well, I think mobilization, as we've been talking about, early mobilization is key. Uh, getting this patient awake, everything about ERAS, just, it's just one of these things. They all speak to each other. And there's mechanical things and there's pharmaceutical things that we can do. Um, all patients should get the stockings, all right? The, the TD stockings. And we should have calf pumps when the patient's in bed. And, and the, the ERS guidelines highly recommend that. A combination of the two. And with the institution of um, pharmaceutical uh, thromboprophylaxis in the form of, we usually cl use clexane, um, and you know, if there's severe renal problems, uh, uh, nephrologists will, will, will probably advise us with, 
but you can use unfractionated heparin, clexane, um, or, 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 or something else. But usually we use uh, clexane, and it should be instituted on the on the first day post op. Um, and um, it's very short talk, but if we don't take cognizance of what it is, I mean, the consequences of missing out simple stuff like this or not contributing can result in that scenario where we doing essentially futile CPR if there's no ECMO. So something to think about. Thanks. Good afternoon, guys. <clears throat> I'd just like to quickly touch on post-operative wound care, which I think is very important. Um, I'll discuss the definition, the causes, types of wounds, wounds classification, uh, wound healing, influencing factors, and signs and symptoms of infection. The definition of a wound is basically a break in the skin or mucous membrane or an alteration in the integrity of the skin or underlying tissue. The causes of that could be surgical incisions, trauma, or poor circulation. Types of wounds would be intentional, so surgical, created for therapy, unintentional, resulting from a fall, an open wound, skin or mucous membrane that would be broken, a closed wound, um, tissues um, are injured but the skin is not broken. How do we classify the wounds? A clean wound would be not infected, usually unintentional. A contaminated wound would be a high risk um, for infection and an infected wound would be dirty, contains bacteria and signs of infection. Wound healing influence, influencing factors um, include age. The older the patient is, the longer it may take for the wound to heal. Nutrition, if a patient is underweight or overweight, then that could influence the wound healing, the extent of the wound, the size of the incision. Um, if the patient has swelling of the lower limbs, uh, that could cause the um, wound to dehease. We've seen it. Smoking restricts blood vessels, um, uh, reduces oxygen flow to the wound. Chronic diseases like cancer, um, diabetes, and infection local, so a localized wound that has pus or discharge or systemic wound that where a patient has a high um, CRP, PCT, or a high temperature. Wound complications will include infection, dehiscence, which is separation of wound layers caused by wound stress. A patient with a sternal wound, we usually preoperatively order a, a heart hugger brace for the patient. So postoperatively, if the patient's coughing, where the uh, physiotherapists encourage the patients to cough, then they usually hold the heart hugger brace to prevent sternal dehiscence and wound dehiscence. Um, joints. Generally, the lower limbs, um, if the incision for the uh, great saphenous vein is going above the knee, when the patient bends the knee postoperatively when mobilizing or at home, that often dehesis and causes an infection. Patients often come back and that needs to be treated, um, including patients that are diabetic. You may get wound breakdown. Deep sternal wound dehiscence, as I've mentioned, the heart hugger is important in educating the patient on how to use the brace is very important. Um, Negative pressure, if in the event the patient has sternal dehiscence, then one of the options would be um, negative pressure, which is vac therapy to treat that wound. Oozing closed wounds, um, where relevant and um, using the ERAS guidelines, obviously we trying to save costs for the patients, prevenal vacuum dressing is an option. This is the type of infected wound where the radial artery was um, harvested. Other types of wounds would be your midland stenotomy, your lower leg wounds, and if you look at this last picture here, where the knee is bent, that often dehesis. Cleaning wounds, um, generally you clean the wound using an aseptic technique. If it's an open wound, you'd use saline. If, it is, if it's a closed wound, you can use chlorohexidine. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, so I'm back. <laughs> Um, before we even get into this, I'm going to appeal to my own personal safety and ask you not to come for me with your pitchforks. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. I was also part of this, so I'm part of this group. <laughs> okay. So I just want to quickly say thank you to everyone that came to help with the data collection. There were quite a few people, even if you came for one hour. Thanks very much. It was a huge undertaking, but we managed to get there in the end. 
we um, selected 32 random files from three participating hospitals. We did collect data on all of these patients, but for the purposes of giving you feedback, I took out 12 outliers. So those were like triple A's, aortic surgery, infective endocarditis, renal failures, and anyone that was longer than 15 days in hospital, just to get a better picture about just the standard open heart surgery sort of patient, just to see what we did with them. We took a time period from the 1st of January last year to the end of June, because that was prior to when James went to the um, Congress where you heard about ERAS, and he already started implementing some of the guidelines, so we didn't want that to skew our data. We wanted a proper baseline. And yeah, we also con collected an angiogram patient instead of a, a cabbage, that one was also tossed out. Okay, so what does the average JJJ open heart surgery patient look like? So this is without the outliers now. Okay, so average age was 60 and a half. The BMI was under 30, which is a normal BMI, which was quite surprising to me. Not surprising, the females make up the, the minority of the group, 62% being male. And then the rest of these comorbidities, I think were actually very poorly documented in the files. And I'll appeal to all the nursing staff that do general assessments where we got this from to please focus on this because I find it very hard to believe that only two patients had high cholesterol out of the more than 20 we looked at. Okay, so we really need to focus on our, our data gathering and our assessment. Um, we know the risk factors for these patients. Okay, so let's talk about length of stay. So uh, this was the only factor that I've had a chance to break down into the different doctors, but here on the left, this is what the average is for all three of them, the whole JJ and J practice. And the average length of stay for a patient in hospital receiving open heart surgery is 10 days. Six of those are in ICU and four in the ward. Um, James, what is the goal for this actually? What is the goal for length of stay yes. for ERAS? Five days, three in the ICU, two in the ward, or other way? Okay, so we need to reduce this by 50%. So it's a big undertaking we have. You can see the breakdown between three of the doctors. It seems like one of them is more reluctant to send their patients to the ward. <laughs> but otherwise, they're pretty much all similar. Okay, this was quite interesting too. The average theater times for these basic open heart surgery patients, the average theater time is greater than six hours, six hours, 20 minutes. That's from clocking into theater and leaving to the ICU, which is also quite long. The induction time is from when they clock into theater till cutting time. So this is where the anesthetist gets the patient ready. And that is on average one hour, 50 minutes, which I also think can be worked on. Our surgical time, so when they start cutting to when the dressing is basically on, is four hours and 36 minutes. And our time on bypass is just over two hours. The time that the surgeon spends with the patient that's off bypass is then two hours, two and a half hours, basically. So that's harvesting the conduits and then afterwards closing the patient, of course. So I think in all of these, we need to look at, we need to have an, an intra-op meeting perhaps with all the stakeholders and talk about different strategies of how we can maybe reduce some of these times. This is absolutely critical for our success in the ERAS program. As you guys have already seen on day zero, there's massive expectations in the ICU on the post-operative care extubating within six hours, having a wake patient, getting pain control adequately enough to mobilize the patient into a chair. And I probably say this a little bit flippantly because I am biased towards the ICU, but if there's a bit of a dilly-dally in theater, that is going to be a failure for the ICU if the patient is coming out too late. We need a lot of time to achieve all those post-operative goals. 
for day zero. And I think this intraoperative theatre time sets up the ICU part for success. So an early start and a reduction in all of these, I don't know if it's possible, you guys will know, can only benefit our patients and we can achieve those, those goals. Please feel free, feel free to comment about this afterwards, okay? Okay, and then some elements of the patient's progress. The time that we take to extubate a patient from the arrival in ICU to extubation was on average 16 hours, 46 minutes. And you guys have already agreed, you know, we've improved drastically already on this one. So even though what I'm presenting to you now might seem quite negative, we've already made strides. This is gonna be easy peasy to actually show improvement. We're going to be collecting all the same data points on these patients from the 1st of June, and then hopefully early next year we'll have another meeting and we'll show the before and after. We were already improving without even launching a formal ERAS program. So maybe it's good to start with terrible numbers. Okay, the average time to get a, a patient to mobilize was two and a half days. So 50% of them on day two, the other 50% on day three. Slightly worse is to get them to eat a regular diet. So no juices and jellies and soups and porridge. This was when I saw chicken or mince or bread or something like that on the chart. I also think this data might not be perfectly accurate because I think it's not collected very well. So can I also please encourage CFs for ICU, ICU staff, unit managers, all of us working in the ICU to focus maybe on collecting the data a little bit more accurately. The diet, I'm sure the dietitians know this. <laughs> okay. We also measured on what day the, cath the urinary catheters are discontinued and that was about on day five. We are now aiming for our patient to go home on day five. Okay, so there's a lot of work to be done there. And then our CVP on 5.5 days. One thing that I feel like we did very well that's being achieved already, even early last year, is the first temperature, core temperature in the ICU on arrival. Out of the 22 cases, there were only three cases that were below 36 and they were about 35.8 or 35.9, not drastically low. So overall, we are achieving that. Our average patient's temperature is 36.2 when they come out of theater. So that's well done. Keep it up. Okay, this was a disaster. Infections, <laughs> okay. So, what the goal is, is the patient does need prophylaxis. We have heard already, we're advocating for Kefsol, um, three doses. It's not 48 hours, I believe it's three doses only. And then if the patient is high risk, has been admitted in hospital before, or has any risk factors, perhaps then targeted is the appropriate prophylaxis there. But I, I wondered, and maybe we must look a bit closer, out of our standard cardiac surgery patients, 66% of them are receiving Targacid as prophylaxis, not Kefsol. So I don't know if there were valid reasons for that, but I found it a little bit surprising that most patients were actually getting the big gun from the get-go. So we say that we should cost by more than 100,000 Rand with, if we manage to achieve our antibiotic goals and our blood transfusion threshold. That may, would make a huge difference. That's like probably like 25% of the total cost of this case. That's why I say this could actually has potential to be quite achievable. Okay. 63% of the ordinary open heart surgery patients had some sort of infection while they were in hospital. And you would expect we would want this to be zero more than half had some sort of infection going on that required antibiotics. I'd like to blame it on too much fluid. I'm sure there's, it's multifactorial, but I think we could probably have a big impact on this if we can get our fluids right. And of course, our basic IPC practice as well. 
contact precautions for critically ill patients. While we're talking about infection, I also sometimes struggle to find a urine dipstick on admission. And I think sometimes we operated on patients that already had a UTI, which caused a lot of issues afterwards. That is a massive thing that we can get right very easily on our preoperative care. And we've revised our protocol for the pre-op as well as the post-op. We, we haven't released it yet. I still want all the anesthetists to just sign off on it. But as a JJJ group, we have made a protocol and you will see it. So please throw away those ones that were compiled in 2014. We're 10 years on and we're embracing this program. So you'll see many elements of our ERAS program come into those protocols. And one of those is that a dipstick must be done. And if there's an abnormality, you need to pick up the phone and let the surgeon and the anesthetist know and send away for MCNS. And we'll put the case on hold if necessary. Nurses, you can make a huge difference there. This is just a sneak peek of my own data collection. Each line represents one patient. And if you look at that last column, you'll see the antibiotic use on these patients. That doesn't look right for cardiac surgery, I'm afraid. OK. Fluid intake. <laughs> this is the shocker one. <laughs> OK, so also, I sometimes found that in the fluid balance intra-op, there were some fluids documented. And you're like, OK, it wasn't too bad. And then you find oh, all the blood administration products that are signed for that weren't included. So we also need to get a little bit more accurate in the intra-op intake. And I please encourage the communication and the relationship between the theater staff and the ICU staff for this number to be handed over. Because you all come, you can see my bias towards ICU, <laughs> you all come in with this very sick patient and you all bugger off and it's just the one ICU sister left. She has very little time to go back and start reading what you guys did. We really need to focus on that handover process and this is one of the points that I please can you hand over to the ICU staff what the situation is with your fluid balance in TROP. Okay. So the average patient, and remember we're still talking about outliers excluded, received intra-op crystalloids 1.6 liters, colloids 270. We know that blood products are also part of colloids, but what, what I was measuring here was like gel effusion, okay, or volumin. Then blood products from Sanbus, so the blood products from the blood bank, the average patient received 770 mils of blood products intra-op with pre-op HBs average of 13. Not sure how appropriate it was or what the reasoning was, but this is just what I found. And then cell-safe blood, we administered 424 mils of cell-safe blood intra-op, giving us a grand total of 2,600 intra-op. Now we move to post-op, 24 hours. So this is the first 24 hours in ICU. The crystal rate total is 2,600 mils. Colloid, 970. That is the we just know value. Blood, blood products was 368 mils. And there was a little bit of the doggy bag remaining 100 mils of cell saver, giving us a grand total of almost four liters in 24 hours in the ICU. And if you add those two together, six and a half liters more or less, which is obviously not over 24 hours. It's going to be a bit more than that divided by 30 hours because our average patient spends six hours in theater. That gives us an average of 220 mils per hour for 30 hours. I don't know about you, but that's quite an overload in my mind. I would not want to mobilize after that either. And you can definitely see why a lot of these patients landed up on CPAP. 
We also saw things in, obviously I am not a medical practitioner, but I was just, I did notice quite on a, quite a few patients that the albumin was being treated post um, bypass, which we know it's going to be abnormal, especially with all these extra fluids. So we did take out um, post-op albumin monitoring. We are going to do it pre-op. So if there is an indication and the patient is at risk, of course, that follows a different track. We're talking about the average open heart surgery patient. Some of these patients were receiving albumin 400 mL stats. I've never seen albumin administered like that before, and it wasn't a single event. It's, I've seen this practice now on a few patients, and all those patients landed up on CPAP after extubation. 34% of these patients required CPAP post-op. The starting point of all achievement is desire, and I hope that that desire has come across in today's launch. I hope that you guys are on board with ERAS and can see that how most of it, we do some of these things already. We just need to tighten our belts on them and then implement a few of these new things with an open mind and together as a team. We're definitely not the first people that are attempting this, but we're the first in South Africa. So that is something to be proud of and exciting to be a pioneer in getting, they, they call it on the website, perfecting the surgical journey. And I think it is achievable. I cannot wait for us to measure all these data points again next year and check our before and afters. That is the data. We can move on to the patient diary. And while Tim gets it on for me, I'd like to just hand out a few of them. I didn't print one for each person, but you'll see them in the units. I'd like to hand one out at least to each hospital and then to each of our surgeons as well. So I'm gonna give the MediClinic one to the ward that will see it first. <laughs> okay. Here we go for Midlands. Okay, is there anyone? Put some med. <laughs> okay, cool. Where's St. Anne's of the Sea, Penny? Where's our Ben? Okay, there you guys. <laughs> you can pass it around today as well, but you, you guys can then take this home as the ERAS champion. Okay, <laughs> cool. I think this side needs some as well. <laughs> okay. You guys can pass it through as I talk about it, but um, they'll be more freely ava available to everyone from June. Okay, so let's have a look at this patient diary. So the patient's gonna receive this from the ERAS coordinator on referral. Obviously, we know that most of our patients are also <clears throat> not part of that prehabilitation cohort. They often go for their surgery um, in the same hospital admission. So we'll adapt according to that, but this is the idea. So it's to encourage the patient to be part of this journey. And we are going to, I'm almost gonna use the patient as a data collector. <laughs> it's gonna be employed. <laughs> and we'll make a copy of the patient's whole diary before they leave as well to use in our statistics. You'll see, here are some of the reasons why we motivate, what we're gonna to use to motivate the patient to be part of this program and to be involved and you'll see all sorts of things here which all sound very good to me especially the patient that's facing the, the what's it the red hat man around the corner pain relief I think that's one of their biggest things and also I wanted to just share with you guys if you check on the ERAS cardiac website in the UK they actually asked patients well not patients the public what their expectations are in terms of cardiac surgery and they asked them what do they think the survival rate is for a patient that undergoes cardiac surgery? 
and it was quite surprising to hear what the public said. They said it was a 50-50 chance of surviving, and we, we know that it's well above 90%. That's how scared they are. Okay, so it's early removal of all the devices, early eating and drinking, reduced infection rates, shorter and more comfortable stay in hospital. There's a part here about prehabilitation. Of course, we know we're dealing with cardiac patients with critical lesions, so we also just want either the surgeon or the ERAS coordinator after communicating with the surgeon to sign off on the prehabilitation pr program. So things like exercises, if the patient is okay for those. We're also gonna encourage them for deep breathing and oral hygiene for, check this out, seven days before surgery, they have to side, tick off that they did oral hygiene twice a day, this will prevent VAP, and that they're practicing with the incentive spirometer. So by the time they're in ICU and have their sternotomy and are sitting in the chair trying to get pain control, they've already mastered the spirometer. You're not coming with new information now and now, oh, you, now you need a new skill. They already know it. And of course, I'm sure there's many benefits to having the best possible tidal volume beforehand. If we carry on, Here's what Fran was mentioning earlier. The dietitians all contributed to some information for the patients to optimize their nutrition status beforehand, which you can read. And then here's the section about those preload carbohydrate drinks of Dr. Bainbridge. And I think we're gonna change that 2200 hours to midnight so that it's closer to the surgical time and then two hours before surgery. So if it's a morning case, that'll probably be 5 a.m. with the pre-med. But this will be very clear on the new protocols, okay? And also just help, just remind the patient also to, to, to acknowledge it in the diary and you'll see the nurse actually has to sign in the diary. So this will be for ICU and ward staff. Okay, smoking and alcohol, you'll see all the ERAS guidelines coming out in this patient diary. Already planning the discharge is in the beginning. Post-operative goals, reducing pain. And while we mention that, I must say in the data collection, the pain score was awful. It was often just written indeterminable at 7 a.m. and then the patient get extubated at 11 and it's not acknowledged again until the following day. There is a non-verbal pain score, guys, on, I don't know if it's on all the charts, but I know some charts have it, and maybe we must include it in our protocols as well. But we really, we are expecting a lot on that first day from these patients, and we're not gonna be successful unless we do get pain control right. And the only way to do that is to monitor pain and communicate with the people prescribing the analgesia. Nurses, you are the link for this and absolutely instrumental to the success of the entire program. <laughs> okay, encouraging early movement, early eating and drinking. Here's a checklist for the patient to check before they come to hospital. Things like, I have arranged my transport. I've checked that I have the right support in place when I get home. I've written a list of questions I want to ask. There's a space for them to complete that. Some of, there's even suggestions of some of the questions that should come from the patient. Here's the patient's expectations for length of stay, eating and drinking, having clear fluids, nil per mouth, etc. And just so you know, I didn't develop this. This is very much copy and pasted from a, a ERAS program that's had great success. We've amended a few words, but I think 95% of it is still the same. Here's some goals and targets that the patient can jot down for us. Hopefully we can achieve that. And then probably the coolest part is this daily progress record. Explains to the patient how to fill it in. And you've seen some glimpses of this on some of the talks. Here is day zero. And this, I know this is a mind shift for us as well. So the plan for today is to sit upright in bed. This is post-op, day zero, and achieve satisfactory pain control.
If back from theater before 4 p.m., you may sit out of bed for two hours. You'll see there, sat out in chair, yes or no. If not, why? March on the spot, yes or no. If not, why? These supplement drinks is what Fran was talking about that our, our groups of dietitians will have to, before the patient goes in, assess the patient and then just cross out what is not applicable or even add more if, if that is what we need to do. And we need to make sure the patient achieves the supplement drinks goal. Here's the spirometry. So on the day zero, we expect them to do it at least five times. And then of course, monitoring bowel action is on every day. Did you eat dinner? And this is not the jelly thing. This is regular diets. Pain score, there's a nausea score as well. Okay, look at the progress. Day one. So in the past, our patient was still sedated and ventilated and highly overloaded. Now, day one, the plan for today is to get washed and dressed with assistance. Sit out of bed for four to eight hours in total. They can do it in sessions, in two sessions or three sessions, and walk for 60 meters can also be done in increments. Achieve satisfactory pain control, eat and drink as normal. And you'll see the blocks on the spirometry have increased. Did you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And then, has your central line been discontinued? Has your arterial line been discontinued? Catheter, has your intravenous fluids been discontinued? Day two. This is usually when we started with mobilizing. The plan for today is to sit in the lazy boy for six to eight hours to walk 60 meters at least twice, and to achieve satisfactory pain control. Try to become more independent with your hygiene needs today. And even more spirometry comes up. This is the day that we're aiming for the patient to go to the ward. Day three, the plan for today is to get out of bed, meet your hygiene needs with as little help as possible, walk 60 meters three to six times, eat and drink as normal, achieve satisfactory pain control. Have you asked about when your discharge might be? We are getting closer to meeting all of the recovery targets. So they should be in the ward by this point. Day four is very similar, very similar goals. And again, when is your discharge? Putting that idea in the patient's head and yours. Day five, continue to build up your mobility, eat regularly, drink plenty. This will all help your recovery and get you fit enough to be discharged from hospital. This is the day we are aiming to discharge our patients. Planning your discharge, we're going to give the patients the surgeon's cell phone number as well as the ERAS coordinator. Some information about the wound, blood clots, when to resume sexual intercourse, bowel action, exercise, driving. Do we ever talk about this to our patients? We want the ward to help us to document the follow-up appointment. And if it's on the weekend, we'll give the patient the right advice, like we always did. We'll just add it into their diary to take home. And then there's a discharge checklist, which they need to go through as well. I'll quickly just share a story to lighten the mood. <laughs> we once sent a patient home from the previous hospital where I worked at, and the patient went home 200 kilometers away and phoned us and asked in Afrikaans, must these clockies still be here in my neck, which was the CVP line. So there, I'm glad it's there. My plastic tubes have been removed. <laughs> okay, very practical things about the discharge. There's a place for the patient to write some notes. And then we've also going to enter in 
all the hospital contact numbers where the practice works so that they can easily contact the hospital, the emergency center, or the ward. And then we're also gonna ask them to fill in a patient experience survey. The goal is to eventually have this all on the app, like Jerome spoke about this morning, but for now, we're gonna start with paper. So yeah, this is the patient diary. <laughs>